times their money went hard. So. Yeah, so then we sold it for four four. Maybe a, it was over a year later because we wanted to wait till over that year yeah. threshold. It was another reason why we we're kind of taking our time because obviously your your tax diff, you know your tax burden is a lot different if with your under a year or more than a year. So if you could wait over a year, you know you want to do that. You know, which is like kind of like we take our time sometimes. You know, kind of like with this one. You did say thirty once. Your ice cream fish. So, can you do ten thirty one? It would be hard to justify, but I'm not an expert on ten thirty one. Um, it's really hard if this doesn't have any producing property because usually at ten thirty one you have the intent to hold it. It's like, well, I got an offer, I could. It's kind of. Defining now, basis is going to be really tricky. Defining basis, but then again, with the the mediator is going to be like, well, I, I can at least have the case where my buddy made me a ridiculous offer. I couldn't refuse it. We want a ten thirty one, but it was on the market with two agents, so they knew that you had an open market. So probably not a good. Well, we didn't ten thirty one it, but. But you, know. but you didn't close either, though, right? I mean, no, we, we did. We closed on the million dollar sale. Oh, okay. We paid cash, yeah. Yeah, so you think about it, you know, there was a lot they went through, right? A lot they had to go yeah, through. Yeah, we have to figure spend it money. out, spend money, you know, <laughs> take some, uh, you know, take some a year. But they bought it at a million and they closed it at 4.4 million, right? But there was cost in there. But. So your flip, your material yeah. cost is like your engineering fees, all of your impact fee, your rezone fees. So maybe you spend 20, 30, 40,000, maybe spend 100, 150,000, depending on the deal. You know, we've got our guy right now is like five or 600,000, you know? So, you know, you're a lot of risk and it's a lot of risk to close, you know, but it's less risk of your own money, but some of these we close with bank loans. So there are only usually 12 or 24 months. So we usually have to have backup plans in case those go over, which they always do, you know, so. And it's dangerous to try to market a property you do not control. Why would you do that? You should you, never. You should never do that. <laughs> yeah. No. So, I mean, you you need to close on it. You well, you don't need to close on it. You can have the, the contract. But you've got to have, you've got to be able to control. You have to have the control, either equitable rights on the contract or you have to take ownership. That's the only way, other way I know how to do it. Or an option. You know, so, which we don't really do very many options. When you're marketing it out there before you close on it, are you marketing your equitable interest at that time or for the property? Oh, so um, the equitable interest, of course, because that's where your equity is. That's your interest in your equity. That's your your profit. So if I was marketing that, if I was marketing this before we close on it at five million, then I'd be marketing my equitable interest, which is the whole five million. Well, uh, Another thing that Greg brought up is the folks that ended up buying this property here. Um, we knew them already uh, from the standpoint that they bought 1013 and 1015, which Greg and Ryan owned, and that we, that Greg and Ryan uh, was another one I us, myself. Yeah, had us start to represent that one as well. That was it was the same group that that. So so when. When we're talking about okay, we let's say four seven ended up at four four. It wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like you know, it's, it was two agreeable parties figuring out okay, what do we have left to get this done right? So where we talked about okay, we had to give up a couple of pads, we had to work on this easement. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a um, what's that? Yeah, it wasn't hostile at all, right? No. It was just okay with these taken out this is what you know so like greg said you know he and ryan and they got on the phone did a lot of talking back and forth you know they know that that group knows what they're talking about that group knows greg and ryan because they bought property from them before that they definitely know what they're doing as well you know so it wasn't hostile you know from that standpoint so it wasn't like you know trying to get nitpicky and try to retrade just to Retrain, this one was right? fairly was, easy for yeah. sure, which makes it a good case study. Yeah, yeah. But here's what here's the here's what they did because remember it's never over, right? Yeah. So what they did was they went to the daycare next door. So we went to the daycare next door and we made offers, and they didn't like our offers and we thought they wanted too much. Well, plotage tells you that if they're next to each other, they're going to be worth more. So they thought the price worked. So then they bought this one and then just put the whole thing together. So now look at. Their road frontage, daycare is gone. So now 
their value add is that all these are now STI eligible, all the ones that weren't. So like now they, we added the value, then they added another layer of value, and now they could probably sell this thing for almost 10 million or something. I don't know, eight, seven, I don't know, more than they paid. But you can't get hung up on the fact that somebody else is going to make money after you. No, I don't care. Yeah, there's a lot them. of people like, well, I I need to get that money. So, I mean, we, we thought about it and we, we just weren't at a position where, you know, because they, can you remember, they had the, they had the daycare, they had a, um, exit from this daycare business that they've had for all these years. So it's not, it wasn't an easy exit. So they've obviously, they probably overpaid for it, but you think that like you, if you underpay for one, you could overpay for another, you know, we've done that multiple times where it's like, you know, would never pay the amount for this one that we did. But since we had this one collectively, it made more sense. And this is just what it makes more sense for them. When you sell your property to the MVP, you ever say like, on special terms, or they said 4.4, but they give you three and hold back a million as a note or something. I won't work with those people because yeah. they don't have, because we are doing these type of deals and they're trying to do something like that, but they don't have the experience. They don't have the backing. They don't have the guarantors. They don't have the net worth. They're just not experienced. Mm -hmm. Now, if it was commercial and it was $20 million, sure, but they're going to put 5 million down. You know, so something like this, I mean, if you can't do a $4 million deal, I mean, then what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. You know, so it doesn't, and it's, yeah. it's way too risky. It's more risk for us too, because now we still need, they still need to close. Mm -hmm. And the, if the market corrects in any way, you know, we're, even though we got an, a down payment and stuff like that, maybe we even don't mind holding it, but it's still the risk. And it's the work, the risk of your not having your capital for other deals. You got to think about that too. So it's like, could we have waited this out another year to get next door? Probably. But then we'd be in this market today trying to sell that. Will we get that same return? So you have to look at like your, your return over time and like market risk and absorption. We know that like those. So we know that there's, I mean, there's projects all over here. You know, whereas this is a for a church bike. But there's like thousands of, there's one right here. There's North Lights and then North Lights goes back to here, then back to here. You know, so we know. There's just all these right here. This is we, oh, where are we at right here? Well, there's tons of them. I mean, they're just everywhere. So you got to look at that and just like determine, is it worth that market risk to try to make, you know, even a million bucks is not even worth it, you know? Greg, how, how many projects like this do you take on at a time? Well, last, well, it depends on how many we can. I mean, last year, I think we probably, I think we had maybe 15 at the most at once. Right now we probably have- At once, simultaneously. Yeah, it's at once. Well, that's why we work the same area, same engineers, we just work it all in together. Gotcha. Work out the same, hopefully the same um, hearings and stuff like that. It's that's like right now, I think- that's we, a lot. Yeah, yeah, right now I think we have maybe, well, this is our big one right here. Um, we have we have offers out. We've got a couple, you know, maybe well right now maybe five, four or five. Well, this is so we own this one, this one, and this one. And this is that right here is that that Riverside the Ewing project that everybody wait till tomorrow the announcement comes out. I don't even know if I should say anything, but you can just watch the news. If our property value is about to skyrocket if it goes our way. And tonight on the hearing, there was a hearing tonight. Everybody's here, so they didn't know about it, but they were on. Um, they were on consent and nobody showed up to object. Really? Of that? Yes. Oh my God. Ryan's probably like, dude, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this is huge. So, what you, I mean, that is so exciting. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. We, yeah. We'll be able to say we knew you win. But look at this. <laughs> but look at this right here. This is something you should look at. This, whenever you're looking at yeah. land, you need to click that because look at what happened here. So this is toward the river. So what is this? They want, this is future right of way, right? But look, it goes right in the middle of our property, right? So over here, we have apartments that are never going anywhere. This road, it's never gonna be built. So now we just have like a road that's gonna just straight dead into our property. So now it's like the big encumbrance here is trying to figure out what to do with that road and work with NDOT and everybody and just like get planning and everybody on the same page to like, do we, you know, dedicate or do we, you know, so for, so here's a 
Am I losing you? Okay. So, so there's another zoning. Go ahead if you want so, to. Uh, on Zoom, somebody was asking about a glossary of terms. Glossary of terms would be helpful. Yeah, glossary of terms. We've asked them which terms. Which terms? So, yeah. Well, you know how some sometimes sure. you can use, a, not you, but yeah. how people can use abbreviations or something. So we're asking them what. What we'll term, put something so. online on our website so, if we yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, so, we'll do, we have another question. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah. Has the demand for builders dried out recently? Do rising interest rates play a material impact on your business? Oh, significantly. <laughs> oh my God. That's it. Why do we have five deals now, 15 last year? Yeah. I mean, it's not because they're moving faster, you know, they're snowballing it or slow. So here's, I want to explain something about this property that we sold not too long ago. So you have, so by right on 411 West Trinity, you can put those boxes, right? As long as it's by right within the zoning, you throw your boxes in and your density. Um, sometimes if there's multiple zonings or something, the city's going to make you do what they call an SP. You've all heard the term. So that means you have to go through the SP process, civil, everything, all the way to the end with all of your boxes, um, could be your art, you know, it could go as far as having architecture requirements and stuff like that. So uh, a way to get around that is you can do a preliminary SP. So we're not the builder, right? But we also don't want to limit our buyers. So what we do is we negotiate a preliminary SP, which we just, we dedicate, so you can't really see it, but um, we dedicated the road in between, there's two zonings here. They SP'd us since we had it, because we did the preliminary, they did the final. So we, there's a road that went through there. So we had commercial on the bottom and then all the residential at the top. Didn't have to box it out. We just made sure that we got the zoning code that we need. I think it ended up being RM something. And then probably CL, which CL or CS at the bottom. But they, the preliminary was the zonings, the road, and then they'll, they'll put some verbiage in there for certain things. So we were able to sell the preliminary SP to the buyer, then they went ahead and did the final SP, and then they're going to either sell it to the builder now, or just maybe they're the ones doing it themselves. I'm not sure. I think they right. sold it. I got a question for you. You obviously have the same amount of hours in a day that I do. You run a brokerage. You did 15 of these. How are you leveraging your time? Is this a lot just falling on catalyst to get this done, or how, how much so, of your personal time is giving you now? I'm not running a brokerage. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Um, so context, like last year, I think yeah, I landed just a broker. Not yeah. Broker. Last year, like between yeah. some land deals and selling listings and stuff, it was like in the mid 60s of deals. The year before it was in the 80s. I don't want that life anymore. This year, I've had two. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then I just work on these. So my time, so we have our team. There's three of us on the team. We've got one person that is mostly in charge of doing nothing but like, the paper, the value add, working with the engineers, reading and knowing the code. He's more or less the brains behind everything. He's basically an engineer. Um, then we have myself, which I don't live in Nashville, but me and another partner, we are mostly like talking to sellers. Um, I work a lot of the end buyers. I, I have a network of builders. I, I, you know, I work with Brian and Jan on deals and making sure, you know, the Brian's not really calling you guys. It's I'm, kind of pushing that through unless we get to like, you know, work on analysis or something like that. And then, you know, we have another guy who we also are like boots on the ground, talking to sellers, you know, driving my properties, going to, going to the council meetings, going to the community meetings. So theoretically, like, it's just a long time, but it's like 20 minutes here, an hour there, a, a meeting here, a week later, a few hours, you know, it's not, it's, it's not congruent time. So you're never, I'm never sitting like for eight hours working on one deal. You know, we're sporadically just going through different things, you know, and we don't, I, I personally, like, we don't go as far as doing pro formas and underwriting the deals. That's just not, we're not the builders, not our job. You know, that's their job. If they can't do that, then they shouldn't be buying the property. Right. You know, so we don't, I've, you'll never see me with a spreadsheet. You're never going to see me doing an underwrite. You know, well, we go price per pad. We do the cost approach and we just guess, you know, I know that they build for 250 square foot. I know we've got a box of 5,000 square feet and, you know, we work our way down to what we think the price per pad can be, you know, get, thinking about the infrastructure costs, like what are we going to it? The, if there's roads and if there's sidewalks, storm, you know, if you're doing a PUD, 
and there's single family subdivision. You've got the roads, the signs, the stormwater, the drains, the curb and gutter and all that. Something like this, we don't have all of that. So, you know, you, you have to take like a rough consideration, but I can do a pro forma on this today and six months later, it's going to be completely different. A month later, it's going to be completely different. So it makes, it takes no sense to do that unless you're the one bringing it to the bank. That's the person who needs to do a pro forma. So uh, Kyle, just real quick on that question too. Um, it's a great question from the standpoint, I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why you kind of probably asked it was, was the fact that Greg was saying, you know, on a lot of these, the different elements, they do a lot of it themselves, right? Between Ryan and Greg and their other partner and, you know, Ryan can, you know, he can go through a, you know, a contract and all kinds of language and, you know, understand a lot of it. So figure a lot of it out, Look, but there's right. some people like, so like a, uh, but they also then know when to engage like catalysts, you know, they're engineers and all that, where you have somebody like Brandon Thornberry who will hire catalysts to do kind of what Greg just said, where they'll hire them to just run it all the way through, you know, planning and everything else for them because they don't want to, they don't want to, not probably necessarily doesn't have the time, but he probably doesn't want to do all of what they're doing, right? So, you know, so it depends on the group on how much they want to in, be involved in doing it versus somebody that just says, here, Catalyst, you know, run with this. Well, even the contract period, we have an attorney. It probably takes two weeks to get a contract done. <laughs> You know, because usually it's like you have, our, we have our attorney, and then, but they have their attorneys too. Like if you're working with NVR and like all those spec home builders, everything has to be, you know, run by and approved by their attorney. Well, is there, you have to look at the laws in their states versus the laws in our states and see like, okay, this law in their state could not favor us. So we need to maybe change, you know, the, the law of the contract, meaning like, you know, we use the state of Tennessee, for instance. So you have to kind of like, have an attorney that could look at the difference of the laws and like even like how days are numbered and like you know every state is just enough different where you have to know the difference or it could be a big deal real cool so people were asking here yeah what does cl stand for what does sp stand for you know what i think i guess that's what they're kind of looking for for you know so uh, you're going to go to this site it's like i know what I know what residential yeah, I mean, I could tell you, but look, adaptive guys, look, residential is and what adaptive is residential mean? is not a zoning, though. It's an, right. but look, you go to this website. So, look, single family. So, let's just go through this. We have agriculture, um, which I don't know much about because it's just agriculture, it's just you got the green belt, and we don't develop in agriculture. So, we got your art. So, single family, it's always if an S, and your number is the square footage of the lot. So, if it's RS80. You have an 80,000 square foot lot. You can build one house and it goes all the way down to R10, RS10. Like ours was RS7.5, 7,500 square foot lot. So you can, that will give you your requirements. Now, if it does not have an S, you have your R80. So you have two units per these. So 80 and R80 is, you know, you get two units on 80,000 square feet. So if you're in a neighborhood that has like big lots or some small lots, Sometimes you can subdivide them down. That's another thing you could do too. You have to like have the average of the two or three next to you. So if you have a bunch of 50 foot, it goes by front footage, you got a bunch of 50s and then like one big lot of 200, then you can subdivide that by right into the 450s administratively. So that'll tell you kind of like over here, RA right, is basically just now um, closer to the road. I'd have to read up on the A, it's been a while. R10, so they, these R's are all work the same, all the way, you see, everybody knows R6, R8, R10, right? So you, now you have your multifamily residential, your RMs. So basically this is like units per acre. So we can do two units per acre, four units per acre, six units, you got, you know, all the way up. Mobile home park is a mobile home park. Um, so now mixed use, you have MUN, MUL, MUG, and MULA. Um, they're all a little bit different. These tell you a little bit of the difference one, uh, difference of what they are. And then if you ever see any of these, now the R's and the M's and the O's with an NS, that means no short-term rental. So that's something you have to remember. If you've got a pad that is STR eligible and you want to rezone it to something for more density, nine times out of 10, depending on the area, 
they'll make you do no short-term rentals. So you lose that eligibility. So you, that's, you have to think through that. Is it worth, is it always worth rezoning, get more density? You know, then you want to look at the absorption. Of course, your absorption of STRs and stuff like that. Right now, STRs kind of died out. OR20, so this is, you can usually do office and uh, residential, so a lot of